Welcome to the 10th South South Forum on Sustainability. My name is Lau Kin Chi. I'm coordinator of the program on cultures of sustainability, Center of Cultural Research and <laughs> Development, Lingnan University of Hong Kong. I'm also a founding member of the Global University for Sustainability and also director of its executive team. I have been involved in the rural reconstruction movement in China for over two decades, and I'm also a board member of Peace Women across the globe. We thank the interpreters of today, interpreting between English and Spanish, uh, Julieta Mendez and Salome Bustani, and between English and Chinese, the Meng Hong and Huan Xiaomei. Let me first introduce the co-moderator of today's session. Dr. Ebrima Saal, also a founding member of the Global University of Sustainability, is the executive director of Trust F Africa, which is a pan-African foundation that promotes democratic governance, equitable development, and African philanthropy, and champions African agency in addressing the pressing challenges facing Africa. He has also in the past held senior positions in other institutions, including as Executive Secretary of the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, Kodesria, that was founded by Samir Amin, and he was Executive uh, Secretary from April 2009 to June 2017. And he had been working uh, closely with Sami, and Sami has spoken very highly of him. Uh, he was a senior research, uh, he is senior research fellow at the Nordic Africa Institute in Uppsala, Sweden, from 2001 to 2004, and director of the Center for the Promotion of Village Savings and Credit Associations of the Gambian Ministry of Agriculture. He is the co-author and editor of several publications on higher education, academic freedom, social movements, citizenship, governance, post-conflict transitions, and development in Africa. I would like to invite Dr. Ibrahim Sal to give some opening remarks. Thank you very, very, very much, Kinshi, for the introduction and, uh, and for being at the center of this whole big process that has been going on for a long time. Uh, it's so so good to be back in this forum, um, and it's good to see that it's been going on. It's ten, you know, ten years is a uh, is a is a big event. The tenth tenth edition of this is a is really an achievement, keeping it going for this long. And I'm happy to see Professor Wen, uh, Mahmoud Jayati. Uh, we'll be missing Firoz, uh, on, but uh, we hope you'll be able to connect at some point. But hello, everyone, and really pleased and honored to be co-sharing, co-moderating this panel with. Uh, with Kinchi on uh, to commemorate, uh, to celebrate, I would even say, a, a, a somebody we loved very much, somebody we respected, somebody who was everything for us, you know, an elder brother, a mentor, a colleague, a friend, and, uh, and a guide, you know, in so many different respects, uh, Professor Samir Amin. Uh, you know, in, uh, in the, his introduction to the, a, a small book he edited with, with selected writings of Samir, Demba Musa Dembele, who is a Senegalese uh, you know, scholar, activist, uh, very active also in the in, in all the activities that, that the Third World Forum was organizing here at Kodesria. Demba, Demba said Samir Amin uh, was the incarnation or the kind of personification of the struggles of the South against the world system. Uh, in other words, it, it's more like he was, he, 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 he sort of personified the struggle for emancipation uh, in, his, in his everything. Uh, and uh, so I think it's really good that the global university and you know I had chosen to to do this co some commemoration and to focus on the theme of uh, the linking, uh, talking about Samir, uh, you know, um, five years after his 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 passing on. Uh, I, I think um, just one or two words. I want to just say two things. The, the, the first thing is talking about Samir uh, and the linking. I think it meant many things in his thinking. It was uh, several things at the same time. First of all, uh, delinking is, is is something we, we we aspire to reach. It's an objective. Uh, it is uh, uh, something that the peoples of the South, in particular, um, you know, would have to make happen 
in order to break away from uh, or to emancipate themselves from the global capitalism and imperialism uh, and the exploitation and oppression and everything that goes with and the power struggles and power you know power uh, employers and domination that goes with it uh, the coloniality and so on uh, so so uh, it is it is it is something that uh, is an, it's an object we must have that to happen we must have it to happen it's something that one has to work towards uh, on the other hand and the second point i want to make is that i think in samir's uh, uh, you know uh, thinking uh, the thinking is a is a is a strategy for disengaging with with the capitalist system and with imperialism uh, and for the south to be able to invent and, and shape the future uh, society that we want, uh, socialist society, uh, or even just to develop, you know, it must it must engage in this delinquent and, and, and succeed in doing so. Uh, thirdly, it is also a precondition uh, in the thinking. It is a precondition for socialism to happen in the South. It is a precondition for development uh, to happen. Uh, and this the second set of uh, observations I want to make related to delinquent is that uh, in theory and practice, in a, in, many, in a respect, it was the lived experience of Samir, actually. Uh, Samir being an organic intellectual, his thinking was about understanding the capitalist system, understanding imperialism, how it is evolving, reproducing itself, metamorphosing, you know, uh, but also how it is impacting on people's lives, on economies around the world, uh, and on societies around the world. Uh, and so understanding those processes is a necessity, and he was engaged in that understanding, not only personally, but he also established institutions to engage in that process with him. And with the constitution I worked for many years, Kodesria, was established by Samir in its current form in 1973, with a view to serving as a platform for African scholars to engage in audacious and independent thinking about all the contemporary problems. Yeah, and they engage in you know, challenging the social sciences as they are, the ways in which we are making sense of the realities around the world, and as a, as a starting point for or, or, and an important part of the struggle against, against the system. So he didn't only do it himself. He established institutions that were engaged in his thinking and, you know, um, uh, and researching and, and working towards the transformation of the system. ENDA is another institution. The Third World Forum is another one. Uh, the World Forum for Alternatives is another one. So he had this institution set up where intellectuals, organic intellectuals like him, but also just ordinary scholars and intellectuals were engaged in this process of thinking and understanding what is required for the linking to happen and for, for transformation to happen. Uh, second thing is also he was involved in his, his actions. Samir's practical actions were actually about bringing about that linking to happen in, in, you know, I mean, the, the, the social movements he was engaged in, uh, the, his active participation in the World Social Forums, uh, the, you know, one of which was the great one when we held in Dakar in 2011, when, you know, Professor Wen, uh, you know, uh, Kinchi yourself, uh, you know, uh, Wang Yu and, and all of those, the, the, these, these good friends were, were with us in, in Dakar here in that year. But he was in that struggle as well. You know, so working with social movements, with trade unions. The third level of engagement in which, it was, and it was a very practical one, was he worked with progressive governments, as we know, that we are seeking to, at the minimum, negotiate a merging that will allow them to, to, to you know, to have a greater control of their development processes, uh, as a step towards achieving, you know, um, the sort of delinking that maybe people are aspiring to. He did it with China. He was in with close to the Venezuela, Venezuela of, of, of Chavez, um, in, in with the Algerian government, Mali, you know, Modibo Keta, and as there as uh, Thomas Sankara, who called him, you know, Mahmoud Mamdani said this interesting story of, of, of Samir saying, look, you know, he was uh, almost like challenged when uh, Sankara, Thomas Sankara of Burkina Faso, a great, great, great African leader, called him and said, hey, you were talking about delinking. Here we are, we want to do it now. How do we go about it? So Samir was in that space as well, practically working with governments that were seeking to do good, you know, and advising them in the best ways you could. So I think um, and bringing all this together, it means that we had in Samir really uh, a lot of things that make them right in what he was saying. But I think he was not only an organic intellectual for the emancipation of the South, he was simply an organic intellectual for the emancipation of all the peoples of the world. Because when he said in an interview with Development and Change some years ago, uh, that for him, development is about building a new civilization, an ecological civilization, and civilization that sort of uh, you know needed to exist both in the north and in the south, one that serves people that is, uh, you know, respectful of all the things that we want, the balances and equilibria that we seek to do. It means he was more than just 
an intellectual of the South, an intellectual of one country. That he was a global intellectual working for the emancipation of all the peoples of the world. So it's an honor and a great pleasure to be with all of you here, and we look up, we look forward to having a great debate as a way of celebrating this great, great uh, uh, friend, mentor, comrade we had in Brother Samir Amin. So let me leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Aprima. So um, our dear and mentor and friend, Samir Amin, he left us in August 2018. It is difficult to believe that five years has gone by without his physical presence with us. However, he has left us many legacies with his thought and writings. We can be sure that if he were alive today, faced with all the catastrophes and atrocities of today, he would still be prompting us to move ahead with audacity and more audacity. In today's session to commemorate Samir, we have invited six speakers to go into the theme of delinking, revisiting this well-known proposition from Samir. They will discuss delinking in theory and practice and perhaps reviewing the efforts of delinking in their country or region. Each speaker will take 15 to 20 minutes. Then we will invite friends who have joined us to speak for three to five minutes, but not more than five minutes as we have many uh, interventions. Then we will invite the speakers to a dialogue. Before we start the session, we would like to show you some pictures of Samir with Isabel and with friends. We are very sorry that Isabel, Samir's loving wife and comrade, passed away 35 days ago on June the 17th at the age of 96. They had traveled a lot together, Samir saying he loved the mountains and Isabel the waters. We would first like to observe one minute of silence in remembrance of Isabel.
we can never forget Sami's loud laughter and open character. His dedication to the cause of emancipation is exemplary. So we now begin with our first speaker, John Bellamy Foster. John is professor of sociology at the University of Oregon and editor of Monthly Review. His previous books on ecology include The Vulnerable Planet, Marxist Ecology, Hungry for Profit, Ecology Against Capitalism, The Ecological Revolution, The Ecological Rift, What Every Environmentalist Needs to Know About Capitalism, and Mars and the Earth, The Robbery of Nature. And his latest book is The Return of Nature, Socialism and Ecology. He is the winner of the Deutsche Memorial Prize 2020. As it is now 5.20 a.m. in the morning of his time, John, ca jo John cannot join us in person, but he has kindly recorded his speech. John would like to quote and discuss Sami's brief definition of Eurocentrism. Eurocentrism claims that imitation of the Western model by all peoples is the only solution to the challenges of our time. So let us listen to John. Eurocentrism is this notion that there is only one universal culture, and that's very, very powerful and um, oppressive. Capitalism itself was was a part of a universal European culture. The critique of Eurocentrism was introduced by Joseph Needham, the great uh, British scientist, Marxist, and, and uh, the world's leading sinologist um, who, who wrote um, Science and Civilization in China. And in his Within the Four Seas in 1969, uh, Needham argued that the basic fallacy of Europocentrism, he used the term Europocentrism, is the tacit assumption that because modern science and technology, which grew up indeed in post-Renaissance Europe, are universal, everything else European is universal also. And for Amin, it's it's the and and also for Needham, uh, it's the ideology of 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 capitalism or the ideology of imperialism. Really, the idea was that that because the Europe represented the universal culture, all other cultures had to follow Europe. They could retain particular elements of their own culture, but as far as universal culture was concerned, they had to uh, follow Europe. So this is the the essence of, of Eurocentrism. And one of the key axioms of Eurocentrism is the notion that Europe is descended from ancient Greece, that all of the thought that would developed in Greece, philosophy of nature, um, materialism, rationalism was a product of a purely European Greece, and the Asian links were denied. The Greeks themselves didn't see it that way. They saw themselves as part of the larger Asian and Semitic cultures of Egyptian culture. Uh, they were uh, very, very much integrated with uh, those cultures and, and saw themselves as derivative. And uh, this is very uh, clearly argued by Martin Bernal in the first volume of his Black Athena. Greece then becomes the birthplace of Europe, purified of its Asian elements. But we know this to be historically wrong. Greece was really part of the Egyptian and Semitic cultures that surrounded it. This is uh, the first edition of Eurocentrism, written around 1988. And this edition in its preface contains his definition of Eurocentrism. This larger edition, written 20 years later of Eurocentrism, does not have the definition of Eurocentrism in it. That preface was removed and an, and uh, a new preface Put in, which starts with the 
a definition of culturalism, the critique of culturalism. He says, in this work, I propose a critique of what can be called culturalism. I define culturalism as an apparently coherent and holistic theory based on the hypothesis that there are cultural invariants able to persist through and beyond possible transformations in economic, social, and political systems. Cultural specificity then becomes the main driving force of inevitably quite different historical tra trajectories. So this notion of, of culturalism is the belief in cultural invariance that are the driving force of history. And he says, this is the primary bourgeois ideology. Now, he argues that Eurocentrism is, of course, the, the primary form in which culturalism is presented to us. And that um, the other culturalisms that have developed uh, that are resistant to Eurocentrism that they actually, I mean, that deny Eurocentrism in favor of their own cultural invariants, they're largely defensive and, and in fact, um, reactionary, and that they they basically succumb to the same ideology as Eurocentrism. They end up being inverted Eurocentrisms in his in his terminology. They complement Eurocentrism rather than really opposing it and complement um, imperialism to a large extent. So he says that all culturalisms of, of seeing history as, as determined by uh, cultural invariants are, are wrong. Uh, they're, they're wrong strategically. They're also wrong in terms of how we, under, we should understand the way in which society is put together and how it develops. You want to be able to emphasize difference. But um, um, Mean is very clear that we want to create a new universalism that brings all peoples together. And um, emphasizing difference is maybe one stage in, in doing that, but then, then we have to find a way to come together on a, a different basis. Amin advocated that countries in the global South delink from capitalism and the imperialist world system. He advocated polycentrism and was an opponent of Eurocentrism and its capitalist universalism. But Amin was equally an opponent of all forms of non-Eurocentric culturalism and cultural nationalism. Was this a contradiction in his thought? What did he mean by the call for a truly universal culture and how is this related to delinking? So the problem here is that um, Amin introduced this critique of Eurocentrism, but not in the interest of other culturalisms, but rather in the interest of creating a truly universal culture. That's what we want to understand. This goes back to um, Amin's understanding of the Enlightenment. He doesn't simply reject the Enlightenment uh, fully. It's a dialectical negation, right? You you know, they, there is a tradition that Marxism represents coming out of the Enlightenment, which is not Eurocentric. And there is a tradition that Marxism represents coming out of the Enlightenment, which is not Eurocentric and and uh, does um, point towards a truly universal culture. Now, for, for him, uh, the modernity, he has a different definition of modernity than, than uh, is characteristic of, well, modernity means a lot to a lot of different thinkers, but um, Amin basically defines modernity as, as um, the discovery that human beings are the self-mediating beings of nature. That is a view that was most explicitly articulated by Marx and, and um, most, um, most um, in the most radical way. Now, this view came out of the Enlightenment itself, 
but was mi mixed with 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 um, capitalist class uh, structure with the ideology of the bourgeoisie and with Eurocentrism. But Marxism focused on the revolutionary aspect of modernity, which um, is an inheritance of all uh, all um, peoples everywhere that uh, modernity is is all about the fact that uh, we are the self-mediating beings of nature through history, that we can change the world and um, we can focus on human development and so on. We can't just reject Eurocentrism and, and then say, well, fundamentalist Islam or fundamentalist anything or... Um, or, or some sort of going back to um, to um, earlier cultures of of a previous mode of production is the answer. Rather, we have to we have to develop a, a universal culture that's open to all peoples, that's that's consistent with polycentralism and with with uh, populist, nationalist, and socialist revolutions. And so he sees delinking. And and uh, the promotion of socialism as the basis of these this development of a truly uh, un universal culture that where um, the the culture is not simply uh, a distorted a weak a weaker version of of Eurocentrism or the other side and subordinate side of of Eurocentrism. This is important. Uh, Amin said the choice remains true universalism that is necessarily socialist or Eurocentric capitalist barbarism. We see at this time China unifying with um, the rest of the South, and this is crucial in the development of the BRICS, in the development of a new non-aligned movement, in in um, the de-dollarization, in all of the struggles that are going on now. But I wanted to emphasize why why on China, um, why its approach it seems to convey this uh, universalism that Amin was talking about. And I just wanted to give a few examples. One one was the link with the global south, where the emphasis is on the development of the whole global south in a kind of a partnership and not really an imperialist framework whatsoever. So uh, China launched the Global Development Initiative, which has, um, you know, as its six principles, uh, prior prioritizing development, adopting a people-centered approach, benefiting all with no country and no, pers no uh, person left behind, innovation-driven development, harmony between humanity and nature, and re results-oriented action. This is a very, very big break from the standard uh, capitalist imperialist approach. Then there's the Global Security Initiative that emphasizes indivisible security, a truly collective security for humanity that's very, very different from uh, the dominant form that's come out of capitalism. In the Chinese approach, there should be no military blocks and uh, military alliances uh, that um, the security of all nations um, should um, be uh, considered under the prin principle of indivisible security. I don't have time to talk about all of this. The third one I, element of their universal cultural projection that I wanted to emphasize, and I think this is rooted in a, a socialist approach. Of course, China is a complex society, but the third one is their emphasis on ecological civilization which some people like Jeremy Lent have interpreted it as, as just coming out of Chinese culturalism, but it doesn't. It comes out of, of Marxism and it's, um, it, it uh, is not projected as uh, a culturalism at all. It comes out of, um, of the philosophy of nature, out of materialism, out of, of socialism. It builds in traditional ecological values from China but it's it's projected as a path for all of humanity, uh, and uh, that we have to together build a an ecological civilization that's quite different than what we have, and it's presented in universalist terms, not Eurocentric, not culturalist. 
So I think this is what Amin was talking about, and it's central to his delinking. I think that this has to be part of our dialogue when we talk about the critique of Eurocentrism. Uh, we have to deepen it and understand that that what we're aiming at is not a group of culturalisms, but a truly universal culture in which all peoples um, belong and um, does not um, privilege difference, um, but also recognizes the differences within uh, cultures and peoples. Thank you. We thank uh, uh, John uh, for doing the recording and his, and his team was helping in doing the editing. So we could uh, come back to uh, discuss some of the issues that he raised. Our next speaker is Professor Wen Tejun. Uh, whom many of you know already. Uh, Professor Wen is Executive Dean of the Institute of Rural Reconstruction of China, Southwest University, and Executive Dean of the Institute of Rural Reconstruction of the Straits, Fujian Agricultural and Forestry University in China. He is a leading scholar on macroeconomics and agrarian issues, independent non-executive director of Postal Savings Bank of China. His monograph, Ten Crises, the Political Economy of China's Development from 1949 to 2020, was published by Palgrave in 2021. The book can be downloaded for free on the, on the link, which we will post on the chat room. So, uh, over to you, Professor Wen. Professor Wen will be speaking in Chinese, so please tune in to the English channel. Please tune in to the English channel, or our fr some friends, you could tune in to the Spanish channel. You can see the globe uh, with saying interpretation. So. On that globe, you could choose your the language that you prefer. So is it okay for you, uh, Loy, uh, a Prima? Is that okay for you? Okay. Uh, Mamdo is okay. Uh? Okay, Beverly, okay. Uh, okay. So now, uh, Professor Wen, please. Thank you, Kenji, for the introduction. Our studies is done by a team, including foreign researchers. It's a big team, including our foreign colleagues. We're together engaging the studies of the collapse of globalization, this massive change, and how we understand Samir Amin in this context about his thoughts on delinking and how his thoughts can be applied and how they influence practices. As we know, this thing of delinking since 2018, since the last US government under Trump, it was made official to the whole world, mainly through measures such as trade war, technological war, biological war, and even this emerging new Cold War. For five years on end, it makes it clear that to China that it makes China want to exit from this vast trading system, trade system. In this process, they began with raising tariffs. And then afterwards, they ask vast countries to form trade alliances against China. It's about uh, trade among alliances. Only the allies can join the system. And as China is delinked, is being delinked, 
China is forced to be delinked in, in this process. I'm not sure how this should be expressed very precisely in English. Anyway, since 2018, this is what is actually happening. This can be combined with another view of farming, which he thought that during the financial capital period of imperialism, because of this expansion of financial capitalism, it will go under a implosion. In this process, we see both linking and delinking. Where delinking is happening now for China. In the past five years or so, this is just a fact, an objective thing. And then we see that the vast led by the US while doing this dealing thing, we can see that prices in the US, like 97% of them due to the star raising tariffs makes the prices in the US go high. This makes leads to the result that since 2008, the US and European countries have been printing money. And after 15 years of this, it has high pressure of inflation. And all these Western countries face these risks. And they are taking the toll. The toll of high inflation is being felt by them. In the past few years, we can see that no matter it's delinking or financial colonization, they both represent what capitalism does in the financial capitalism phase, how it's going to implode. This is the reality. We can see that in the US, except that the virtue capital is expanding, causing problems to it. We, can, we should also be able to see that real economy in the US has completed its transfer to outside of US, which means that the US now has to depend on countries like China to provide them with cheap consumer goods so that their society can continue, can go on. So currently, uh, the US is having a oversupply in terms of finance and then undersupply of production. And this is exactly the reverse of the 2029, 20, uh, 1929 to 1933 depression. We can see that um, the US is constantly asking China to have a dialogue with it because it understands and it realizes that it's under production can only be resolved through the provision of consumer goods by a productive, industrially productive country. And our main theories are being enriched today through the practices and the realities of the world, no matter we're delinking or linking, it cannot resolve the problems the US is undergoing, the serious crisis it's undergoing. So today we learn from Samir Amin and inherit his thoughts. When we do this, we should do it in combination with the current affairs of the international society and this collapse of capitalism around the world. And that's how we should see it it's about linking or delinking. And if we try to summarize the big events of the world that is happening now. We can see that during the financial capitalism phase, 
the hegemonic countries can use these military powers to push forward their financial hegemony. But finance, it can achieve some results at the lowest price, that is by printing money. It is a colonizing process for any country in the world as long as it's a real economy. The revenues from this economy can be offset by this money printing and the revenue in turn is being ripped by financial capitalism. This is an important phenomenon at this phase. From this phenomenon, we see that it's an important condition for this implosion of financial capitalism. That is, if every single country in this world is keenly aware that the US dollar as a currency, it has no real economy to back it, and there's no no metal, expensive metal to back, back them up. When countries understand this, they will have an understanding of this irreversible trend in this world. That is, any country that can export either its products or raw materials, these countries will step by step de-dollarize and do not use less and less US dollar for settlements. Any country with a real economy, no matter they're exporting raw material and energy or their exporting products, they will have a better understanding of how this virtual expansion of the US is hurting this whole world, is harming it. So every country will gradually begin this de-dollarization. Previously on one of our forums about a decade or so ago, I talked about why Iraq was destroyed. It's because it does not want to use dollars for settlement. So the same reason goes for the North Korea, because they want to use the euro and don't want to use the US dollar. So the, all the countries that trying to do the de-dollarization was de devastated. So now it become a trend, the de-dollarization. Now we can see most of the countries that have the power to create, create foreign reserve through their exportation, they don't want to use the US dollar because now it's being devalued. They don't want to use it as a reserve currency either. So as long as you, the country has its real economy, um, whether it is uh, exportation or importation, a, a manage, manufacturing a country, as long as these countries, they can rely on their own currency and more and more trying to promote the de-dollarization. Now, then we can see this, in this process of the cap financial capitalization, we know the, the uh, financialization of the capitalism will lead to its in explosion and we will see it become true. So now we are in the phase when America is trying to rely on its hegemony to, re to require the other countries to, re to rely on its own uh, the uh, US dollar. The linking is to link the countries in to prevent them from delinking. The countries, especially with the real economy, with, um, deficit, with the supplies, is, they don't want to to they don't want to link closely with um with the US dollar. So this is the trend of the of the of the of the world, which is which is which is which is kind of uh, proved what Amin said five years ago. I believe as long as we keep our head straight, we will see the 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 rule that provided by Amin and you will become true in our world. But America's military, military power is not sitting there for to just to show off. 
that's why we can see America trying to trying to reach uh, trying to present its military existence in the Pacific uh, Asia area. The Asia Pacific area is the where where the uh, where we share the most um, productivity of the world. That's why the American is trying to show off his muscle in the uh, Asia Pacific area. America has 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 already more than three hundred military bases around China. What is that for? Is to prevent from linking, prevent the real e uh, the the physical economy from from the financial from uh delinking from the uh, american american financial uh, financial uh, financial sector so that's why we still need to study um what Amin, Amin has left us and try to apply the theory to what we are what what we are witnessing nowadays from that we can see the disintegration of the globalization and its essence I believe my time is up, and that's the much I want to share. Thank you. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Wen. So, so, um, okay. So, um, well, we will be going into the question about the economy, about the um, the dollarization, and how. This could be a strategy for also uh, for the for the different countries from the south. So our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Tran Dak Loy. He is the standing vice president of the Vietnam Peace and Development Foundation. He was the standing vice chairman of the Central Commission for External Relations of the Communist Party of Vietnam. He is also the standing vice president of the Vietnam Peace Committee. Loy has been a long-standing friend of Sami and had been in many international conferences together with Sami. So Loy, please. Thank you very much, uh, Lo Kim Chi. I would like, first of all, to express my sincere thanks to Kim Chi and her colleagues for the initiative and endeavors uh, of conducting these meaningful events to commemorate our greatest friends, comrades, and mentors, Samia Min. I uh, am very happy to see Kinchi, Mamdu, or Professor Wen Tenshun, and other colleagues at this forum, and would like to convey to you the warmest greetings uh, of solidarity and comradeship from Vietnam. In my intervention, I would like to recall several outstanding com contributions of Samia Amin to the cause of the peoples of the global South. I think that one of the most important theoretical contribution of Samia Amin is the renewal and upgrading Marxist critics of the contemporary capitalism. Samia Min have clearly defined that the imperialist monopoly capitalism now is transformed to, into generalized monopoly capitalism. He called Sinai capitalism. He discovers the law of global values, which expose nature of exploitative uh, exploitation by the global, uh, of the global South by the global capital through the position of the imperialist rent. If Marx discovered that capitalism accumulation will destroy the two bases and origins of its wealth, the human beings and nature, Samia Min has added the third aspect of this destructive dimension, the material and cultural dispossession of the dominated people of the periphery. One of the most important discovery of Samia Amin is the exposition of center periphery relation and polarization in the contemporary world, where the center is imperialist triad, United States, European Union, and Japan. 
if Lenin has described the imperialism, imperialism as the highest state of capitalism, then Samir Amin described it as permanent state of capitalism, which dominates the world system by monopoly control of technical invention, access to natural resources, the global capital system, a financial system, communication and information technology, and weapons of mass destruction. Samir Amin was among few intellectuals who discovered that the finalization gives monetary and financial market a status of dominating market, which can lead to the explosion of the financial bubbles. He was among the 10 intellectuals who predicted in 2002 the forthcoming financial economic crisis, which will begin in the United States and spread in, into Europe and to, into the world, uh, what actually happened in 2008 and 2009. Samir Amin also was, uh, was among the few who predicted about the implos implosion of Europe, which be, should begin with the exit of the Britain out from the European Union. And later it had actually happened with the Brexit. Samir Amin was a strong critic of capitalism liberal democracy in which the workers and peoples are deprived from the decision making processes affecting them. He stated that democratization, uh, the, the decline of democracy is the inevitable the result of the process of concentration concentration of power to the exclusive advantages of the capitalist oligopoly. In his opinion, democratization should be organi organically associated with social progress, and there will be no socialism without democracy, but equally there will be no democratic advance outside of a socialist perspective. Samir Amin warned us about twilight of the historical development nowadays. And in this twilight, it will be the time of monsters. And we need to be careful with that. One very special contribution of Samir Amin is that he strongly believed in the strength and the role of the global South, that the revolution advancement will begin in the periphery, not in the center. He called for audacity and unity of the global South to delink itself from capitalism and the globalization imposed by the imperialist center. His ideas of the international creation of the international workers and people is a uh, one of the greatest contribution and this project is this biggest project his project still pending and waiting for us to follow and implement it i would like to say that many of the predictions of samir amin has been proven in real the de development of today's world not only the financial crisis not only brexit but also uh, the fact that uh, the period of unipolar order of the world has gone away, and we are witnesses now the beginning of multipolarization of the world order. The G7, the total GDP of G7 today is less than the total GDP of the BRICS, and process of de-dollarization is the uh, has begun uh, very intensively nowadays. And we can see all this form of delinking from capitalism, from imperialist order has started and with the initiative and efforts of the peoples of the global South. And I would like to, on this occasion, uh, to, uh, to, 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 urge all, all, uh, all of us to think and to follow 
what Samir Amin has started and devoted his life for those purpose. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Lloyd and Jack. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly for this uh, very interesting and very stimulating talk. Uh, we now move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Professor Jayati Ghosh. Professor Jayati Ghosh uh, is among the 20 prominent personalities appointed by the United Nations General, um, United Nations, by the United Nations to a high level advisory board that will provide recommendations for the UN Secretary General to respond to the current and future socio-economic challenges in the post-COVID-19 world. Professor Ghosh joined the Economics Department of the University of Massachusetts Amherst College of Social and Behavioral Sciences in January 2021. Prior to that, she had taught economics at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi for 35 years. Uh, Professor Gosh is a very well-known uh, global intellectual from the South, a regular contributor to major newspapers around the world, including The Guardian. She uh, led this great network of heterodox economists uh, called Ideas International Development Economics Associates for a long time uh, while she was still in New Delhi a network that, that was uh, established strong participation with people like Joe Moko and Sundaram on this uh, call and the call of other people all around the world. So it's a pleasure, uh, Jayati, and an honor to have you to speak on this great occasion. So we are listening to you with uh, keen interest. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Abrana. And, you know, thank you, Kinchi and Global University for Sustainability for organizing this, for keeping the flame, actually the flame of, of Samir kind of burns in all of our hearts and minds, but it's lovely to have this coming together to, to recognize his contribution. And uh, so thank you so much for organizing this. And also for really interesting interventions, very uh, profound interventions, in fact, that we've had so far. I, I'm going to try and emphasize the class dimension of what we've been talking about uh, so far, because I think it was very much part of Samir's own perspective. And I, I want to position this in terms of what I think imperialism is, which I believe is along the lines that uh, Samir himself talked about and Prabhat Patnaik and others have mentioned, which is that it's a struggle over economic territory by large capital. And it is that struggle of, you know, uh, of large capital amongst themselves, which is aided and abetted by the nation states. Uh, so it's not necessarily, it's not just country to country. It's not in fact at all country to country. It is capital versus people everywhere. The tragedy is that capital is able to persuade people in their own countries, that in fact, it is about this country versus that country, but it's not. It's about the economic territory that uh, large capital wants to control. And that economic territory includes labor, it includes nature, it includes access to markets, and of course, increasingly knowledge and technology or what is now codified as intellectual property rights. So with that broad definition in mind, I think it's important then to look at the way in which imperialism has changed or is changing and uh, what that means for the delinking process. So I think it's evident and has been very beautifully outlined by everyone so far, uh, that it's no longer hyper-imperialism. The phase of globalization that was also the hyper-imperialist phase with the US in complete dominance is over. We now have competing powers and that gives us instability, it gives us danger, but it also gives us potential. Uh, 
all periods of this kind of instability have been periods when you've got autonomous industrialization in developing countries and you have um, different possibilities for development. But of course, now is a very different time. We have a new context with very large global public goods or global public bads, really. We have climate change, we have health pandemics, we have the spillover effects of economic and social tensions that end up with military uh, consequences as well. And so here, I think we need to look at this again in terms of some concepts that Samir outlined so beautifully. In his work, Samir talked about five monopolies that were essential to the global economic order, yes? The monopoly over technology, the monopoly over finance, the monopoly over access to natural resources, the monopoly over communication and media, and the monopoly over the means of mass destruction. I think these are such essential ideas today because we are seeing these play out and the attempts to maintain these monopolies becoming ever more severe and more critical. But then there is another uh, concept that Samir highlighted, which was he had, he had a sort of complex notion of class structures, but one of the classes that he definitely emphasized was the dependent bourgeoisie in, um, shall we say, the non-imperialist countries, the countries who were the objects of imperialism. And I think that's very important. Just as imperialism is not about one country versus another, it's not only the big capital in large, in big rich countries versus everybody else. It's big capital and dependent bourgeoisie in our own countries versus our own people as well. So it's a much more complex situation in which we have to look at these changes in global economic and political power. These changes are occurring, but they are in process. This process is far from, from complete. The whole idea in, uh, I'm right now, uh, as, as we speak, I'm speaking from the US and the uh, it's extraordinary to see the extent to which the media has pushed this whole idea of the fear of China. That you know, that the, in the US population will become slaves of China and they are going to take over the world and so on without recognizing that China is still in that process of developing, that it is, it has exhibited remarkable transformations, no question about it, dramatic improvements in uh, per capita incomes, in living standards, uh, and many other social indicators, but it is still uh, not on par with the rich countries in that sense, and there is uh, some way to go. But also these processes are not inevitable straight lines. They are, they can shift, they can change. And what the US is doing at the moment is everything in its power to prevent that process from coming towards a possible conclusion. The trade war that was mentioned, and I, I agree with Professor Wen that there is a significant trade war, but it's not about trade. It's about technology. That war was always about preventing China from accessing or creating the top technologies, the frontline and leading technologies in the world, whether in terms of all of the productive forces or communication and media or means of mass destruction. And I think the recent changes that we have seen in industrial policy in the United States and in Europe have to be seen in that light. That is to say that the recent changes in the United States and Europe are very clearly protectionist and they are protective of domestic production capacity. They are protective of domestic employment, but most of all, they are protective of knowledge and technology. 
So one of the interesting features of globalization that we had experienced in the past, uh, since the 1990s, was that trade got globalized, finance got globalized, technology really did not, except for one very big exception, which I'll come to. So the intellectual property rights regime was absolutely critical in continuing that monopoly over knowledge. Labor did not get globalized, capital got globalized. And of course, that meant a dramatic shift in bargaining power. Basically, globalization meant a shift in bargaining power in favor of capital versus labor because there was an increase in global, globalized labor supply with the greater integration of China and to some extent India. And this could be used to keep the power of workers in the rich countries uh, constrained. And it dramatically increased the bargaining power of capital based in the US, based in Europe, but everywhere, the power of capital increased. Knowledge control, the ability to monopolize knowledge has been particularly marked because it was legalized in the intellectual property rights regime of the WTO. But after that, with a range of bilateral agreements, uh, of plurilateral agreements, comprehensive economic partnership agreements, many of them contain these clauses or chapters on intellectual property. In fact, even in bilateral investment treaties, of which there are thousands in the world today, there are nearly 3,000, um, investment includes intellectual property. So these are also being interpreted in ways that will monopolize knowledge further. The big outlier in this, of course, is China. And I think that's what is so significant, that the Chinese strategy involved a strategic linking into the global economy, to the capitalist global economy, from a relatively delinked base. But it was a strategic delinking that certainly relied on trade, certainly relied on some foreign capital being invested, but fundamentally enabled transfer of technology through the requirement that all foreign investors had to operate in joint ventures with Chinese partners and that thereby transfer of technology was enabled. Now, this was a very particular and a very impressive strategy because it reaped dramatic rewards, but it is no longer available to the developing world. The rich countries have realized what they allowed to happen and they are not going to let it happen anymore. They are going to do whatever they can. And certainly large capital in the rich countries, which is very much, uh, shall we say, in favor of that particular control, will not allow any further uh, transfers, not just to China, but to anyone. And that has implications for industrialization for the rest of us, because this access to knowledge is now critical it's critical in all sorts of ways, of course, for industrialization, but also to maintain public health, also to ensure that we can cope with climate change. Not just mitigation, but even adaptation now requires more and more of the knowledge, a lot of which is available, but is not being adequately shared. And then, of course, the protectionist strategies that we are seeing are going to make it harder to use export-oriented industrialization, which was another significant strategy of you know, the Chinese, as I've called it, the strategic linking. That, again, is less available because of changes in the types of production, the much greater use of the uh, artificial intelligence, robotization, and so on which means that a lot of production can be reshored, brought back to national board, uh, boundaries. A lot of the production can rely on less and less labor. And it means that industrialization is no longer the means for shifting labor from agriculture to industry, because it's not going to employ more labor. That again is a big problem for 
most of the global majority countries because we haven't done that. We, we have not shifted labor from low productivity to higher productivity activities. But on the other hand, we desperately still need to industrialize because industrialization generates synergies, it enables innovation, it allows the productive forces to advance, it provides some kind of stability and resilience to economic shocks, it also improves the condition of women. So we, we need to industrialize, but it's harder to industrialize. So I think that's the context in which we have to look for the rest of us, for the global majority countries that are not the rich countries or China, because I think China is in a completely different space at the moment. What do the rest of us do? And I think for the rest of us, we really have to think of delinking in a slightly different way in terms of regional and plurilateral initiatives. They can be what the US once called the coalitions of the willing. I think we have to have our own coalitions of the willing as a new means of generating economies of scale, exchanging knowledge and technology, enabling finance. It's important to have these coalitions because that's, that way we can also impact the multilateral processes. We know that the current international financial architecture is extremely unjust, unequal, and it's not going to change anytime soon because the rich countries will prevent it and capital in the rich countries will prevent it. But if there is enough combinations of countries doing things independently, and if they fear irrelevance, then these institutions also will change. I'm thinking of regional development banks. I'm thinking of different types of trade agreements and finance agreements. I'm thinking of tax cooperation. Two days from now in Latin America, there will be a big conference for the region on how Latin American countries can do tax cooperation. Because the OECD process for tax cooperation turned out to be another instrument of imperialism. And it, was, it has resulted in a compromise that is bad for the developing world. In Latin America, this initiative, I think it has huge potential and we should learn from it and perhaps engage with it and think of other ways of doing that because that will allow Latin American countries not just to share information, but also to push the multilateral system to get a more equitable tax treaty a tax convention, to tax multinationals the same rate as domestic corporations, to ensure that we can tax extreme wealth, to stop illicit financial flows. It's very important to do all of that. And final point, I've talked for too long already, but the final point I want to emphasize is that we are getting trade deglobalization. It's happening, yeah? It's, and it's happening because the North is pushing it but we are not getting enough financial deglobalization. And that's what we have to do. We have to delink in finance because as long as we remain integrated in these global capital markets, then all the other things that I've talked about will become much more difficult, if not impossible. So we have to think of different means of financial delinking. And there are some options out there. Once again, this is something that is almost being assisted by the rich countries. If, if everyone feels that if the US government decides they don't like you, they can freeze your assets, they can commandeer your assets to do what they like with it, they can do anything, then less and less people will be interested in holding dollar assets. So we have to think of different means of financial deglobalization, particularly for trade credit, for emergency finance, for sharing of reserves in crises. And I think those are ways that Samir would also have celebrated. So I think there are ways we can cope with what is a very difficult situation. And a lot of that inspiration will come from Samir Amin's own work. Thanks.
Thank you very, very much, JIT, for those um, extremely interesting and important points you raised. Uh, strategic delinking and uh, just just one of the key concepts that came 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 through your your interesting conversation. Coalitions of the willing, our own coalitions of the willing. Uh, and, and yeah, a lot, a lot, a lot on the table for us to think about, um, inspired by, of course, Samir's thinking as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Huang Ping. Huang Ping uh, is a senior research fellow of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences since 1997, and he's now the executive president of the Chinese Institute of Hong Kong and director of the Center for Hong Kong, Macau, uh, Taiwan Studies at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. He has been doing research on development, including poverty, labor migration related to health and environment, and globalization. Uh, he obtained his PhD from the LSE in 1991, uh, he was the deputy director of the Institute of Sociology uh, and the director of the Institute of American Studies and the Institute of European Studies at CAS. This is, that is the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Professor Ping, you have the floor. Uh, yeah, you're all listening. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. to speak here as a commemoration of our main. And I've always been thinking that if he were still with us today, what would he view this world today? Well, not just him alone, in also Giovanni Arecki, also Gunda Frank, also Emmanuel Wallace, all these people, if they were, they had been still with us, how would they view the current world today? Well, without question, I believe Armin would have continued on the basis of his original analysis, theoretical analysis. He would still bravely with audacity to handle all the current challenges, risks, crisis that we're undergoing now and also deal with the ongoing and upcoming conflicts he would deal with them the same way well these concepts theoretically except the, the dependency theory and world system and what we see this so-called globalization and the discussion about global south and how glo what the opportunities this whole global south is facing faced with today because of this capitalist global system and all the monopoly it has in all sectors and areas of the world of uh, its hegemony in terms of economy technology finance information including knowledge, reproduction of knowledge and information, and also artificial intelligence. Also in military terms, their military hegemony around the world and a combination of them, the, this complex of all these hegemonies. So today, this deglobalization we're talking about today, uh, had Armin been able to discuss with us today what are still undergoing globalization and what are being deglobalized now? He brought about the concept of delinking back then. And this concept with what the US and the West is doing, like they're trying to exclude China, to decoupling with China. What is the relationship between the delinking and this de-risking by the EU and decoupling by the US? So this 
globalization led by the U.S. Is this just a capitalist globalization? Or according to Armin, does our global south or developing world? All this global south and, and the socialist bloc we used to have many countries around the world today who do not want to be part of this Western system or the countries which the West want, want to exclude from the system. Ironically, the West represented by the US are afraid of less developed country like China among the global South. It's a global South country and it's not a capitalist country. Their fear of China's catching up and their fear that China will be part of the system. So that's why they want to decouple with China to exclude China from the system. So this new transformation of process of reconstruction, not only in terms of international relations and not simply among the relations between countries, we should also go again, go back to arming and just peers theory on world system. Is it the possibility that we can have something like this that is because the vast, the hegemony, they do not want the developing world, the global south, be part of their system, whether they want to catch up with them or they do not want the global south to have a piece of the cake be precisely because they don't want this. Will there be a two systems that we have, that we may have, other different from what the two systems we had during the Cold War? Is it a parallel way that these two systems exist? Like the global south would not be diff be part of the system of the Western countries. So what if, and another aspect, there, there will be a system that is non-capitalist. Non so the next question is, what will it be? Is it parallel? Like these two systems will be parallel for some time or they will be complex all the time. And it will lead to the, for example, nowadays we already see the trade, the war of trade, the trade war, the technology, technological uh, tr uh, war, and even hot wars. I think if Amin was here today with us, he might come up with these ideas. So now the, here comes to the second question. If it is not the country, the relationship between the countries, or even the, the 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 relationship between the global south, the conflicts between the global south and the global north, like the G seven, and if, for example, it is on the aspect of the finance and economy, and next we have the technology and communication, and of course, and of course the energy, whether old or new, and all the related issues such as the environment, ecological uh, uh, problems, and the, uh, the, and of course, all the way to our knowledge, the belief. So it's not only limited to the terrains, but it's not only limited to countries or the concept related to all of those, like the global south, global north, but all the different aspects its original system will it survive and also if the other countries they cannot join or they won't be allowed if they want to join it won't be also difficult along with the development the whole the development of the global south we can see the it is the global south that want to decouple the this global south so in this in this circumstance are we going to continue to uh, build a, an alternative to the capital system? Or 
will these two systems be parallel for some time or will there be conflicts? So we don't know how to describe this new situation and this new system. The next question is the, the capitalist system, no matter how strong, how powerful it is, however many resources or profits it occupied, it is now it is now in decline and even when in Emmanuel Wallerstein or um, Ami, Sami Amin, they have written a lot on this aspect that the capitalism is in decline. Even inside the system, its own, uh, its own management is also not as strong, as powerful as as before, all their influence on the other countries, but we can, we have to still see the destructive force it has on the society, on the ecology, and even on the civilization. So, in this new situation, we, I think we, the risk or the potential or the challenge or this kind of disorder it's becoming more and more a new normal. They are no longer, the, 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 what is prevailing is not order or stability. Although we are not, although what we, what we, what we're looking for, forward to is not like stability or or, 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 or this kind of uh, terminology. But what we want to see is the uh, word, uh, uh, word prosperity, pro prosperity. But because what we are witnessing now is the ecological disaster and all the structure, or whether it is the, 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 the society or the, bio, um, the, the whole ecological system. So the governance, now we don't see the order we don't see the order in the global governance they are talking about the rule based order but what we witness now there's no rule the ro the, the 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 order is already gone what we witness now is the disorder so in my opinion we are entering into the what Amin has already has already analyzed and also pre uh, foreseen. I would also call it the restructuring of the global order, the global order, and also the global structure. It's all being rebuilt. And you can even call it not just in the global south, not the, only the global south, global south want to delink and all the, all the, all the global north want to decouple the, the global south. It's far more than that. It's not that clear. It's more like in a mess. And I think this kind of disorder will last for some time. And the global elites, they are they are occupying the most of the resources and the profits and the opportunities. So the global elite, they are no longer restrict, limited or constrained to just the global north or United States or West Europe. West Europe is more than that. In the nowadays, they are more and more becoming a, a, a leading, taking a leading role. Because now we are entering into this kind of disorder and even maybe possibly full of conflicts in order to prevent, in order to, to find a new order in this kind of disorder, I think is what we, can focus now and trying to find a path through the disorder. Of course, in order to find a new order, we will see all kinds of uh, conflicts. And that's, I would like to, to share. I know it's a bit abstract, but 
it could be a kind of my uh, my my intervention, but also my remembrance of uh, Amin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ping. Uh, it's also and a very inspiring talk. Very good points. Uh, thank you so much for adding, you know, uh, to the to the conversation in this big way. Uh, Kinchi, over to you. Okay, thank you. So now, before we invite uh, the our four speakers to interact with each other, uh, we would like we have a, uh, many friends with us. So we would like to invite them to to give uh, maybe three to five four minutes of speech. So Hanan, are you ready? Could you could you uh, turn on your camera? Okay, Hanan, um, maybe you could do a self-introduction so people know who you are. And so Hanan is from Venezuela. Hanan, please. Hey, greetings for everyone. Mm. Uh, my name is Hernan Vargas. I'm from Venezuela. I'm a militant from Movimiento de Pobladores, which is an urban platform struggles. I'm also a member of a political secretariat of Alva Movement Platform and uh, also uh, researching about uh, popular economies and social reproduction. Oh, and currently I'm part of the government in Venezuela, I'm vice minister for communal economies. So I'm really happy, really honored to be in this 10 South South Forum. By the way, I actually had the opportunity to meet uh, Samir Amin in a, in a site activity organized, but by this by this instance so uh i could say that actually in venezuela uh at this time at this time we remember that when hugo chavez passed uh samir Abin mentioned that uh hugo chavez dies but bolivarian revolution continues and he mentioned this because he says they have uh set uh, a process center on liberation of, domina of domination, imperialist domination, also the building of a process of unity of peoples, and also a process of uh, democracy uh, center in the service to the worker, to the working class. So I think that actually at this point of our, of our uh, continent or global south, we can say that we have concrete examples in Venezuela of this path mentioned by Samir Amin and that we think that are actually part of the of uh, the linking path. Uh, first, uh, I want to refer to the decolonization uh, line of construction that we have embraced here in Venezuela. On the one hand, we have questioned this idea of uh, the history from Europe, where they mentioned that we have a process of discovery of America. From Hugo Chavez, we raise uh, the flags of liberation of people, of indigenous peoples. So then we start a process of deconstructing this civilization history, this Western civilization history center in Europe. And we now say that uh, this was a genocide process that, uh, uh, blockade the process of construction of an alternative society in our in our continent. Also, uh, according to these, they they have, I think that during the past years we have um, started a process of regional integration, center in cooperation, and not in the market, uh, not in the free market, not in neoliberalization. Uh, thesis, but instead in the process of cooperation to the link and to build sovereign uh, process. As an example, recently we have a, a meeting of CELAC, which is an alternative space of integration to the OAS. And that's, that's a, an important uh, issue of building a new ways of integration, not dependent from the colonial uh, powers. The second issue that I want to mention is uh, related to economy. 
On the one hand, we have this initiative that Chavez promoted of a cooperation center in uh, regional development from the South. He proposed this uh, idea of the Sucre, which was a mechanism of exchange in the, in the region, base, not based in dollars. It was a, a system uh, 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 both in the possibility to exchange directly in the values form uh, generated in our region. And also in Venezuela, we have been promoted. Chavez was always a critic of capitalism and neoliberalism, and also the necessity to build the socialism from communes as a possibility, as an alternative. So right now we are building here these uh, policies based on popular economies, on communal economies, centered in uh, social property way forms, and also self-management, self-management words, and of course uh, the possibility of a system based on reproduction, on social reproduction of life, instead of uh, capital reproduction. And the last issue that I want to mention that is a concrete example of forms of the linking that we have been embracing here in Venezuela, it's related to this idea of uh, an authentic democracy uh, centered in the communal power, in the people's power. Uh, as an example of that, in the last 20 years, they have started a process of building some uh, base structures that uh, they are called communal councils. The communal councils are forms of organization of the communities center in people's assembly, and they delegate uh, some servants in order that they can be the community government. Recently, we have a, a reform on the, on the law, on the act of uh, communal councils that actually defines them as as the first base of, of government of our, of our uh, political system. Uh, as an example, right now, we have in the country a total amount of 47,000 uh, communal councils that actually reunites something like 10 million persons in total. So uh, we actually think that this is an important contribution to the possibility to build uh, uh, an alternative model of democracy, alternative to the to the Western uh, ways for so-called democracy. So these three examples uh, for me it's a, it's a concrete ways in which in Venezuela, uh, in Latin America, we have embraced this thesis of delinking that Samir Min uh, shared with us in her history of construction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hernan. Yes. And Hernan has been uh, working with us uh, uh, to produce two series on the Venezuela in struggles. And all the videos have been uploaded to the Global University website. So now I would like to invite uh, Paolo. Yes, Paolo will speak in Spanish. So please tune in to your English channel. Thank you very much, Kinti, for the invitation and for giving me this space to speak i would like to congratulate uh, and to greet all my friends i haven't seen in a long time and for the rest i am paolo nakatami um, professor professor of uh, university in sao paulo i'm an economist i would like to congratulate the organization of the forum of course this important debate that is the delinking from the global system it's a very complicated topic with a lot of different fields to find solutions and paths. I would like to only mention a small point about all this. The global capitalist system created a structure of national states and 
and the countries that are developed and um, in development and those countries that are developed with the leadership of the United States are littering the global system. And the part I wanted to mention is that this it's related to the movement of the capital that needs to go through um, this system. And one thing I wanted to say, which I think is very important, is that those countries, uh, depending on these developed countries, believe it's important to have reserves and international reserves are done uh, in um, the United States um, and this creates a debt of uh, these countries to the developed countries. So having dollars, it's not good for the countries that uh, accumulate their reserves, but it's a, it's a privilege that the less developed countries are financing the United States. So at the same time, we cannot get out of the situation without facing many losses and problems every time a country wants to get out of their dollar reserves uh, to get other kind of reserves, they can have losses, especially countries that have a lot of reserves like Brazil and especially China and Japan. So this is a real problem. And another problem is that this situation, it's a privilege also for uh, the leaders, uh, the el elites uh, at a local level. Their interest interests are related to the production of the capital over the dollar dominion. So we have a very important problem at an international level on how to delink from the dollar system and the internal problem as well, because local elites do not want to get out of the system. Those elites are, have their interests and their specific profits related to the dollars. So I think the struggle is placed in two uh, ways, internally and externally. I only wanted to say this, there are so many other things we could mention, but for me, this is very important. Thank you so much. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Paolo. So could we have Beverly, please? Beverly, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Kimchi, for inviting me to say a few words. I hope people can hear me okay, because I'm, yeah, okay, good. So um, I'm um, actually the director of a center named after Giovanni Arrighi at the uh, Johns Hopkins University and in the United States. And uh, right now I'm, I'm in Brazil. And uh, I just want to say that uh, I used to see uh, Samir regularly at a conference organized uh, annually by Teotonio dos Santos in Brazil, uh, where uh, it was, it, that conference was uh, in a sense, a precursor of the South South Forum and the Global University Centers because it was bringing people from uh, critical thinkers from around the world and particularly from the third world uh, and, uh, in debate and, and for the, there were really vibrant debates between um, Samir, Gunder Frank was regularly there, Manuel Wallerstein, Giovanni Arrighi, and it was uh, really uh, an inspiration and an honor to be able to listen and to some extent participate in those um, discussions and debates. And as other people have said, uh, it, we would really miss having uh, both of all of them uh, here today to see what they would be saying. Um, so um, I I think the um, the question 
uh, that's happening now um, that, uh, you know, Samir's thinking and writing is an inspiration for is this question of the uh, problem of the U.S. decline and the U.S. refusing to accept a more uh, equal world and therefore moving in different directions in a weird sort of delinking, uh, which is a, a form of exclusion and changing the rules of the game because the 1990s rules of the game have ended up leading to the United States losing out or, or in a relative decline. And also a mobilization of a kind of military and militaristic solution. So a combination of a change toward a much more protectionist regime and an exclusion, particularly of China, and a mobilization of a, a kind of militaristic solutions. And um, so, which rem kind of brings to mind Samir's uh, empire of chaos. So uh, I don't, I just uh, wanted to, you know, take the three minutes to just say, um, how, how in many, many different ways, Samir and others are uh, incredible inspiration and in particular, not uh, in part their theoretical and uh, intellectual foundations, but also their intellectual and political courage because we need a lot of courage in this moment to confront the challenges and, and so I take also inspiration from his commitment and his courage uh, going forward. And I'm very much happy to see everybody here and uh, in solidarity. Um, thank you. Thank you, Beverly. It's so good to see you. So now uh, we are over to Goose. Goose, please. Thank you, Kinshi and Global University for organizing this tribute to Samir Amin. Samir is greatly missing us. We need his ability to analyze the situation in which we are. The combination of economic, ideological, and geo geopolitical crisis. It's a crisis of capitalism that combines great dangers with great opportunities. The emergence of the global South at the barrier of a response to the construction of a new world is in this time of greater danger. <clears throat> that new proposal <clears throat> can emerge. And uh, Samir was really bearer of this. And thank you to have organized this. Thank you. So, uh, Sharif, Sharif, would you like to say something? And Mamdou. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very Sheriff. much, yes. Al Kinshi. Yes, I want to thank you very much for this important session on delinking in theory and practice. It is always a great pleasure to see my friend Ibrahim Mamdour <laughs> and all <laughs> colleagues and friends. Uh, Sharif, and can you turn on your camera? I, I, I don't have camera. I'm in ah, okay, airport. okay, don't worry. Please go ahead. Okay, I'm in an airport. As I told you, I'm uh, on my way to St. Petersburg, where is being held a big forum on Africa and Russia. So uh, I am currently in the airport and uh, won't be able to take part properly in this seminar. I will, however, say these few words, a summary of what I will say at uh, St. Petersburg. As is happens in Russia, I say I'm the director of Third World Forum in Dakar since the death of Samir Amin. I'm sorry. Don't in Russia we have, I have to talk right, uh, about the new uh, avenues, new ways for economic, scientific and technical cooperation 
within African countries and Russia. In my paper, I talk about dealing a disconnection that does not mean breaking cooperation with the rest of the world. In fact, the truth is capitalism has been unable for 22 years to truly replicate itself in the global South and all around the world. So I think it's time for us to seriously draw the consequences. I agree that capitalism must be studied as a disposition system everywhere it becomes the dominant economy. But I think we should also learn capitalism as a civilization. It's what I'm doing since many, many years. I think this aspect is very important. Covering the entire capital space means for us taking two things into account. Firstly, Capitalism need center and periphery. The second aspect is when capitalism arrive in the society, the first target that uh, it attacks are values and virtues on which that society is based. That's why we hear everywhere in Africa and everywhere about the loss of values. In order to create it, the capitalism creates the naked individual. The individual disconnected, delinked with the traditional solidarities of his society. Uh, and so I think we must concentrate more on the conception of. Uh, human rights promoted by NGOs and organizations in the non-political society. We need to talk more and more about right of people. The answer then is to organize ourselves to tackle and master the condition of sovereign and popular yeah. accumulation. Because delinking is first and foremost the will to control our decision-making autonomy in terms of inclusive economic and social development. It is based on the potential sense of our countries, which have an interest in the, a realistic and feasible alternative. Secondly, this determination must be reflected in the search of financing models that are relevant and consistent with our determination to transform our comparative advantage, resources, endowment into competitive advantage, technical, economic, and financial consistency. At last, it is uh, something is happening since uh, 2018 in Africa. Something very interesting. It is that since 2018, the African aid state are talking with their partners, with the international organization, a way that they have never talked with them uh, uh, as they are doing now. At every meeting since this date or summit, the head of state aligned themselves to some extent with the position of their people. This is something new. They are demanding sovereignty in their own affairs. The last net of the strength of old international economic and financial institution. They are increasing, rejecting, forcing, indebtedness, and so on. Nevertheless, they will have to align themselves uh, wherever possible with the people. It is what I think and uh, use them as a buckle, évidemment. But they will, uh, uh, there will be, there will a long way from that. 
I thank you very, very, very much for giving me the floor for these few minutes, Lawkins. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharif. Thank you. Uh, so, Mamdo, please. Kinji, thank you for attending this and remembering me. And thanks to all friends and comrades. Um, I'm not going to speak about things that are obvious or things that have been dealt with in the speeches of many before me and going after me about the principles of Samir and uh, his theories about delinking and so on. Because now I consider delinking is become has become more far away from us now if we try to compare the situation of the left in the entire globe from six years ago and now it is much worse today and as our comrade Jayati has mentioned it's not about the will of a country to delink. It is the, the situation of the ruling classes in most of the uh, global South countries. We have, uh, compared with the situation six years ago, we have a much less degree of independence in these uh, global South countries. That means now we have to speak about derailing. Uh, uh, we want to get the train back to the rail in order to be able to speak about dealing. I have understood and I have studied this long time ago, especially from the lectures of uh, Professor Venti Jun about the dollarization and euroization and so on. This is not new, but the capability of realizing this is today much less. So uh, uh, talking about delinking among us sounds for me something like wishful thinking because we are not representing the regimes that have to, to join this process of dealing. These regimes are now, I mean, most of them are now much more dependent and uh, they be become their policy, especially financial and economic policies, dictated mostly about the United States and and similar uh, G7 countries. I'm, I'm speaking from our perspective in the main region of the Arab world, in the Middle East, or whatever you want to, to call it. Now, it is now, if we look at the situation of the left, which is interested in this dealing and pushing, so the situation now is very bad also in Europe, it's not only, uh, there are some exceptions in Latin America, but this is all. If you look at European countries, uh, the EU or African countries, or even Asia, the situation of the left is much less than such. That leads me, this comparison leads me again to the very important paper which of Samir, which I called at that time his last will. This is his call for building the new people's and workers international. These are a very short text of Samir about exactly four uh, pages. And he has summarized uh, the whole situation which has become worse than, and told us in a very clear way what we need today, we as the left, as those internationalists, as we like to uh, 
to define ourselves. We have only one way to go, and this is exactly the last will of Samir. We need to, uh, to uh, build and construct not only a forum like we have everywhere, we need an organization. And I know how difficult such an, an organization could be, but what we have to, to, to start today in order to fulfill this, what I call last will of Samir Rumi, is just to start this process because building this international, which Samir has defined very carefully and very accurate, uh, is a long process. It's not just a, a gathering of, of some followers of Samir, but it is a process which could take generations. But I don't think that there is another way to push into the, the, uh, the goal we defined our, our process now is the delinking. The delinking cannot be achieved or even really significantly starting without unifying the left internationally. And that is exactly what we need now. Thank you. Thank you, Mando. So now, please, uh, Mando, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, I'm from Delhi, taught in Delhi University for a long time. Uh, have been involved with human rights activities and peace movements and uh, people's movements. Uh, uh, now, I, I would like to join everybody in uh, paying my tribute. Uh, like many others, uh, we miss uh, Samir Amin so much. He was a great inspiration to all of us. Um, I was also part of the Teotonio dos Santos Reagan Initiative in Rio uh, and many other. I mean, we invited uh, Samir to deliver the uh, second uh, Oliver Tambo Memorial Lecture. The first was by Mahmoud Bamdani, second was by him. Now, um, I just want to reaffirm one thing which has emerged in course of this uh, <clears throat> discussion. Uh, dealing King, as I understand from Samir Amin, uh, is not like decoupling, uh, and it is not. Uh, it is not about only uh, considering the uh, uh, object of dealing king as a territorial uh, political economy or a country as was uh, just now said by Mahmoud. Uh, uh, it is about uh, critique, about resistance, and it is about alternative, creating concrete alternative possibilities. I think the, we have several presentations, including from Venezuela and on other days during the forum. Therefore, it is a, a political economy and cultural communication, or all those five monopolies that uh, uh, Samir Amin talked about. Uh, so how they operate uh, in all countries, we, we have the existence of uh, the um, uh, contemporary global capitalism, uh, neoliberal capitalism. I mean, I have a term for that, uh, silicon capitalism using high tech and many other related means. So uh, how that operates in our own countries. Uh, uh, but it's very important. And that's why it's not a question of being helpless. Uh, it is a possibility that we see that we uh, engage in delinking in our own environment, in many spheres, right up to the globe, fighting global neoliberal neocolonial capitalism. That for that perspective, uh, we got from Samir Amin and we very much value that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mano. So now please, uh, Jomo, good to thank see you. Thank you very you. much, Kinchi, and thank you much, very much, uh, Ibrima. 
um, for for this initiative. I think it is very appropriate and important that we recognize the uh, vast contributions of Samir Amin to uh, our thinking. But I personally want to register my own personal uh, intellectual debt to him. Um, uh, and uh, it has been extremely important over, uh, I hate to admit this, but half a century, more than half a century. Uh, allow me to, to emphasize what I think he might say and here I'm speculating, but I, what I think he might say are our tasks today. I think uh, he would say that uh, that we have to understand the two different, the two uh, contradictions of capitalism, uh, not only the contradictions among classes, uh, but also between humanity and nature. And this forces us to address the question of sustainability. And this, I think, is a very major challenge which we face before all of us. Um, secondly, I suspect he would say that perhaps delinking is too confusing and problematic a term. Um, we need to continue the anti-imperialist struggle. And what that means varies very considerably because of different at different times and in different circumstances. This anti-imperialist struggle was recognized over a century ago, but it remains still very relevant and pertinent today. And um, and it's and many of the people who have spoken today tonight and many others who will, who may not get a chance to speak. Uh, all uh, feel that 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 need uh, to recognize the different dimensions and the need to maintain that struggle. The third point I think he would he would uh, emphasize is the point which Joyeti uh, made earlier, and that is to recognize the inter the variety of circumstances each of us faces in in where, where we are and so on. And it is very difficult to aggregate all this to say that this is the single most important contradiction. And what unites us really is the anti-imperialist struggle. And this is, I think, part of the reason why, as Abrima reminded us, he was able to talk to governments, not just of progressive governments. Uh, he was able to talk to ministers. I mean. Uh, Part of the reason Kodestia has a special position in Dhaka, Senegal, is precisely because of his ability to deal with the first president of Senegal to get certain privileges for, in order for Kodestia and others to work in Dhaka, Senegal, uh, with a certain degree of freedom in what is essentially a very neo-colonial situation, uh, even in, in, the, in those days. So I think we need to recognize that we are we live in very different circumstances, and we need to forge uh, various different uh, alliances, um, recognizing this this struggle. But I think he would emphasize to us that the pro continuing priority is the struggle against imperialism, and this has been a priority I think for 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 us especially in what is called the global south and of the global majority uh, uh, to this day. So I would, I would, uh, so part of the reason I'm so enthusiastic about what you have led Kinchi through the, uh, this, uh, uh, this series as well as with the university uh, is precisely to remind us of these different dimensions of what Samir would have liked us to address. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jomo. And now, please, uh, Victor Hugo, uh, please introduce yourself. And then we will have Maria. Good morning, everyone. Uh, greetings from Ecuador. I am the national coordinator of the Commission for the Defense of Human Rights, which is a non-governmental organization that has 
been working for over 20 years in support of social organizations, uh, both peasant and rural and urban organizations in their processes of social and political participation in the drafting of projects of productive development. And it holds a series of claims that are generally against the capitalist hegemony and the public administration systems that are practically subordinated to transnational companies. I had the honor and the pleasure of meeting personally Samin Amin. I took part at the World Forum of Alternatives that he was leading in Dakar. I was invited by him and lately I've been very sad for the uh, passing of her of his wife Isabel just a few days ago. I also admired her for her militant struggles and, and she was very much in solidarity with Samir's work and also with what all uh, other people did. So I'm very happy to see again uh, Mamdou, for example, with whom I've been uh, participating in international events at some point. I participated alongside Samir in his initiatives of uh, seminars in, in Tunisia, in Argelia, uh, in, in El Cairo. These were very concrete proposals of what he had already defined against modernity as it's uh, interpreted by capitalism, which is simply seeing democracy as uh, another element of the uh, free market system. To the contrary, he suggested uh, an alternative, a very practical alternative of establishing international solidarity, which is something that we are uh, witnessing, a South-South relationship in this building of the, so of the global South that we have been discussing at this session. But I would like to point to Samir's contribution in what has to do with the DIN linking, which is something that has been so uh, discussed here, which is also called the connection here. That is a redefinition of the dependency from uh, of the peripheral areas from the capitalist center. This was a very great challenge when Samir uh, stated uh, the need of the energy transition and the transition for uh, humanity's common good. He saw a challenge in multipolarity in terms of a practical political construction of the respect of human rights and the respect of nature and of, above all, seeing the possibility of having the exchange rate subordinated to the value of use of things. So this proposal is cost-cutting in terms of interculturality, intercultural the respect of uh, community identities, and just a series of processes that should be carried out a sort of transition for uh, post-extractivism, that is respect of nature, respect above all of uh, food sovereignty. This is at the moment uh, a major challenge for progressive organizations and leftist organizations to, to be able to uh, suggest concrete alternatives in terms of political participation uh, that is intervening in the state with proposals, with uh, participating in electoral processes in order to access administration and from that position to implement local alternatives that can then be mainstreamed at the national and international levels. 
among uh, Samir's initiatives of solidarity internationalization, uh, we see this uh, third world forum, this uh, global forum of alternatives, and of course, the constitution of political and economic alliances, as we are witnessing right now in a part of Africa, in Latin America, with uh, the UNASUR initiative, for example, or ICLAC. So international uh, spaces that are trying to consolidate a proposal for a post-capitalist transition. These are progressive and left wing governments that in a way are trying to implement these processes. Of course, they have been faced with a tremendous opposition, both by the um, internal uh, dominant classes and the different transnational companies that are uh, on the lookout for their wealth and also uh, on the part of the government of the United States. So these um interventions through the world bank for example are restricting the initiatives of internationalization in solidarity terms it's very hard to establish for example in south america uh, a unity to in a way um exit the capitalist market controlled by the united states and european countries at, at some point, a regional currency was, dis was discussed, a, a currency that could uh, replace the dollar, which is quite complicated, and that entails not only uh, positive aspects, but also negative aspects, because uh, managing one single currency is always in the hands of the great monopolies. So in this sense, for us, this discussion, this conversation today is very uh, hopeful for us because it gathers the fundamental ideas proposed by Samir, which in a way are, are present, even though if, if we don't name him in, in writing or in essays, essays, because sometimes people fear uh, quoting him for fear of uh, of uh, backlash, but his proposals are still alive. So it's very important for us to redefine democracy not as a uh, market freedom, not a freedom for organizations to do whatever they want, for monopolies to do whatever they want, but actually as a respect of the rights of peoples and a collectives and, and of nature. So please let me point this out. In Ecuador in 2008, when we amended our constitution, this was the first constitution of a country in the world that acknowledged the, the rights of nature, not the right to nature, but the rights of nature. So anyway, uh, we have some activities in mind that depend on uh, Amir's contribution. We, of course, remember him and also we uh, keep him in our activities and in our militants. So thank you. A big hug to all of you. I'm very ha happy for having participated here. Uh, see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Victor Hugo. So now, uh, Maria, could you please start by introducing yourself? Uh, thank you very much, um, Kin Li Chi, Kin Chi Lao. Yeah. I, I need to introduce myself. My name is Maria Pakpahan. I'm from Indonesia. Uh, I'm now based in Scotland, yeah, in Scotland. I used to work with the International NGO Forum for Indonesia Development. It's an umbrella organization, consists of more than hundreds of uh, NGOs abroad, abroad and also in Indonesia back into 1997, 95. And then I studied a uh, different study in Institute of Social Studies in The Hague. And then I decided to take a sabbatical and went to Northern Africa. And that's when I met Samir Amir in the uh, El Tayer. And also actually, uh, that's why I want to give a tribute and also to another colleague and another comrade. Um, it's uh, Helmi Hasrawi also from Egypt. 
I think okay. he just also passed uh, last okay. March. We were together in, in Tunisia at that time uh, and also other colleagues. But my tribute to Samir Amir, I remember that uh, when he was a little boy, from what my reading, when he was six, you know, he saw this uh, very poor child in Port Said. And he asked his father, because Samir coming from a quite privileged family, you know, what this poor boy did, and he was looking for food. And Samir, uh, little Samir Amin said, I will change the world. That was his comment that time. And that's one, one of my uh, rem my point of remember about Samir, of, of course, of his theory, but also the idea not only to, to interpret the world, but to change it. That's, that's why I think activism is very important, you know, with, with a help with intellectuality and all that intelligence. And in this note, you know, I will remember Samir as anti-imperialist, number one, and now number two also anti-racist, and third is anti-capitalism. And in that uh, a platform, he was talking, uh, I think uh, Jayanti mentioned about the monopoly, but I will bring it to my country context. At currently, Indonesia is trying to to be more developed, to be, be better, you know, in terms of uh, because uh, we have this demographic, uh, what you call it, um, young people who need job, and also we have a lot of natural resources. Uh, we are very blessed in that sense. However, you can see how the capitalist and also imperialist system still working through its mechanism. One of its WTO, for instance, but also even European Union, I would say, is still trying to prevent the uh, so-called third world country to be more progressive, to be more difficult, to be more equal. Yeah, and one of it is using the instrument of law. Uh, Indonesia now in dispute in WTO regarding the nickel, you know, export. It's being trying to be banned, uh, the Indonesian government, uh, my president trying to ban it because we want to process it. And if you actually look to the, 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 the value, if you just send it as a raw material, it's only like give you $3, but if you process it, it's become $30, okay? So, but that's being prevented by WTO saying it's you against a free trade. So we used to be colonized back to you know uh, you know three hundred years ago. The Dutch came, you know, the Spanish came before, and the Portuguese came. They're looking for the um, spices, you know. Uh, they're looking for uh, the 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 Far East. They call it Far East because the central was London. It's Southeast Asia. We call it now. But then, you know, after the independence movement, after Second World War, we Indonesia got independence in nineteen forty five. But even after more than 75 years, the, the so-called imperialist country, I will still see it that way, start to dictate what you can send, what you can sell, what you can trade. Yeah, but at the same time, they're also not allowing for the free people. So it's a free capital, but not free people. That's why we have a lot of migration issue at the moment, right? But at the same time, also you cannot, you cannot be in the same level with us. You just send all that coffee in bulk, that nickel, you know, all what that raw material, as if the people in Indonesia cannot have a brain to develop, cannot learn about, you know, industrialization and so on. So we lost in WTO just last year, but we're now going to the what you call uh, for a second uh, high court, you know, kind of uh, appeal. And this is uh, my president, he's not from sociology or anthropology or political scientists, but it's the first time he actually talking about, this is feel like being colonized. And to me, that's a uh, opening, uh, what you call it, uh, opportunity to actually to, to mention it to the wider population, to the nation. You know, this is a, uh, what you call it, a uh, uh, silver, uh, glove colonialization, you know, and that's why I think in G20, I know that Minister of uh, Finance of India and Indonesia, Minister of Finance of Indonesia, both are women, are not talking about, you know, whether we can use the same currency, like rupiah and rupee, you know, 
and this is uh, the, the point when I'm talking about BRICS, I hope I was hoping BRICS, especially China, is will be more bold uh, to, 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 to what you call it as a spare hat to bring change, as Samir Amin said. It's, it's not enough to interpret the world, but to change it. The thing is because we are running out of time because of climate crisis. I think um, I have said, uh, and I, I always like Samir because he speaks French and that to me is kind of like helping me to learn more French. And last but not least, I will say, I think this kind of um, a forum and platform will be useful if we can make it in the bigger scale. So a lot of young generation need to get in touch with other, you know, critical theory, not only what the, the, the major media. And in last uh, but not least, I just want to point out the missing of the anti-war movement. I didn't hear it when it, it was invaded Iraq. I hear it when Afghanistan, I heard, I heard about it. But what happened in Ukraine, in, in Russia, we're going to even bigger war, but the anti-war movement disappeared. So I just want to put that to the forum. What really happened? You know, where this this anti-war people, the anti-war movement? I think that's all. Thank you, Kinchila. Uh, thank you, thank you, Maria. So now I would like to invite uh, Ibrima to make some comments and also to pose questions for our four speakers. Ibrima, yeah. please. Thank, thank you, thank you very much, and thanks everyone really for the absolutely wonderful comments and absolutely great points that have been made. I just just taken off from where Maria where Maria ended, but where also she started. It, it's about changing the world. Okay, it's not about only interpreting, although interpreting is important, but uh, it has never been the sole preoccupation of Samir just to interpret, but also to to, to participate in changing the world. I think that's a fundamental point, which is what, you know, the, this thesis 11 <laughs> uh, from, from the time of Marx. Um, and I, I think just a couple of couple of things which I, which for me are very striking from all the, from all, both from the initial contributions and from the comments by the additional contributors. Um, one is what seems to me the importance of uh, being really aware of what what the, the context we are in today, right? The, the context, both 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 globally and for everyone, the local context as well. I mean, the, the point that Jomo was making about the fact that we are in different situations, different you know processes, different challenges, and so contexts are different. So, understanding the context remains very very important. Uh, it's about all the things that have been talked about already, the five monopolies and the global bads, uh, as, as uh, Jayati nicely reminded us. But, but context remains important. And once that is understood, the question then would be, how do you understand the linking in the context in which we are, the, both at the global level and what is possible to do uh, at, the, at a particular level, level maybe not, not necessarily a very micro level, but at the local level. Uh, and so, um, you know what? What, is, what are the tasks? What are our tasks? You know, both at the global level, what is it that we need to confront, and what are the tasks that say, for example, people who are trying to make a difference in a particular context at the level of Africa or in Latin America or across the global South? Uh, what is it that we see as our primary task, and how do we how do we create a coalition of the willing? Again, if I'm a an expression that has been made uh, around whether it's international that has been mentioned that Samir got down to very concretely. But even before you get to that level, there are so many other things that, that, that could be done. So the second point, uh, the second or, so, or the third question uh, for me is, uh, of course, has to be all the challenges that some of the, which have been mentioned associated with the linking, right? Uh, and the, the different issues that one has to contend with, uh, the struggles being of a class nature, existing at, on so many different fronts, including having to deal with our dependent bourgeoisie and our local elites. Uh, and I think all those things came up in the, in the, in the, in the presentations. Uh, and so, so the, there, is, there, are, there are enormous challenges and you know, the, it would have been fascinating to hear a little bit more about, about Venezuela, for example, or, or the challenges confronted by other countries that have tried to, to break away from this. I mean, when Samir 
was invited by Sankara. Mahmoud Mandali tells, tells his story in his tribute to Samir. And he was saying that when uh, uh, Sankara invited Samir after they took over in Burkina Faso, and he said, look, we want to do this. We, we are now you know, ready to embark on the, the linking process. And he was almost like taken aback, uh, Samir saying this himself, because he never expected that it would be from a country like Burkina Faso where he would be having to answer that kind of question. You know? So uh, of course, this is the question of what is it possible to do at the level of a country, right? What is it, what, what kind of scaling up, you know, international networking movement building is required for it to have any chance of succeeding and being sustained uh, over, the, over the long haul. And it takes me to another point, and it will be interesting to hear more about also the successes. Uh, so please, uh, dear panelists, when you are responding, what are the successes that one can point at, even if they are limited in this process of the linking? I was amazed by what Jayat was saying again. China has done it. Uh, they did they engage in a very clever strategy, very intelligent one of strategic delinking. Uh, and uh, but then people woke up to what they've been, uh, you know, um, of, of, of the new situation that has evolved with China being able to do what they have done. And so certain possibilities have been sort of uh, blocked in, in there. It doesn't seem to be available anymore. So we need to think harder. But what are the success? Do we have successes? Do we have successes? Pointed? You know, do we have to, and how do you sustain those successes? Uh, and and uh, and I and I think of course the the all, all the other issues that have been mentioned, in the importance of technology in this, uh, and uh, and how do you get uh, really a clear and interesting conceptualization, you know, of of you know, an alternative way of doing things, you know, that was Mohanty in his intervention. So there are a lot of things that came up, and it would be interesting to hear you, please, just to speak to that and say. Uh, you know, we 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 know what the uh, or we we have a sense of what the, the big challenges at the global level are, uh, but then also there has to be some interventions that uh, at the regional level people are trying many things. Talking about currency zones, if you're talking about de-dollarization, you have something to replace the dollar. Could it be at the level of one country? Could it be a currency adopted at the level of the BRICS or at the other level? Uh, uh, in West Africa, there's a whole debate about the. CFA farm, uh, what to do with it. It is a colonial hangover that is still very alive and well. And uh, the whole debate as to whether it is keeping people further into the bondage that was uh, built out of colonialism. And, you know, um, and, and it, it surely has that, that role. Um, but if you want to replace it with something else, what would that be like? And what is the coverage? So there are many issues I think that have come up in this. Uh, Conversation that is extremely rich, and it would be it would be interesting to hear your feedback. You've been silent for so long after having made your initial contributions, so I think it's just fair enough to give you, give the floor back to you, the initial panelists, and maybe in the order in which you came. Um, of course, uh, John is not uh, is not with us, so we will probably start with uh, with would would be Jayati or 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 or, or Doug. Uh, and then we hear Professor Wen. I think we should, from the um, from the perspective of the um, practical experience, because I think most audience might not have very deep understanding of the history of China's um, delinking. We should know that in the 1950s, because of the uh, Korean War, America first have first uh, have uh, have sanctioned China and also of course have a whole embargo in on China and this is the first delinking of China. At that time, China's um, foreign direct investment is from Soviet Union. At ninety nine in nineteen ninety, um, and China, USSR has already retreated all of all the investments. So, which means at that time, sorry, it should be nineteen nineteen around nineteen sixties. So. From the 1960s, China doesn't have any investment either from USSR or from America. So China entered was forced to enter a full wing, um, full wing uh, delinking. So at that time, we have this kind of a slogan, which is to fight for yourself and to be self-sufficient, to be uh, self um, auto to be autonomous. 
because at that time we do have uh, already this kind of uh, aim. But during the whole 1960s till 1970s, we have 20 years that China, we, China is, China was, was delinked totally from the, uh, from both blocks, either from America or from uh, USSR. So this is two decades long delinked experience in China. During that time, in order to prevent, pre to prevent a uh, war from happening, China moved the industries from coastal cities to the hi highland, uh, which means now the China's in the land, in the land also have the chance to go into the industrialized era. That is from the 1950s and all the way till 1980s. So during those, that time, China has the chance to, to construct its own industrial system. This, if we put it nowadays, under, and inside this kind of Western lead um, uh, system, we don't quite see this kind of similar ex experience. China, through this, built its own autonomous industrialization. And in this last for 20 years, it managed to build its own industrial system. And we call it the the industrial globalization, industrial capital, um, industrial, industrial capital globalization era, China managed to do the, the linking. Now it's in the financial capitalization era and China was forced again to the, the linking. If we call the 60s was forced to the link because of uh, USSR and also America and China managed to do the delinking. This time is because, well, USSR is no longer and it doesn't constitute a hegemony. Now is the financial hege uh, the America who forced on China the delinking. And China now has to enter its, to, to, to have to rely on itself to be self-sufficient. Now, um, this time America uh, took the initiative and China entered into the um, ecological civilization era or the strategy of the ecological civilization. And we also rely on the big circulation of um, big circulation of domestic, domestic circulation M uh, strategy. And China also, meanwhile, China focus on the global, global South cooperation. We have prepared ourselves we already prepare ourselves to be delinked completely by the West, which is not us who took the initiative, it was forced on and we think it's inevitable. So China will rely on the, um, the, inner, side, the inner circulation, the domestic circulation without joining in the, um, the industrial or financial competence of the West. So now we are in the era of the financial globalization. While we rely on the domestic circulation, we can try to build a unified market, a domestic market with the, with the, uh, with the balance between the rural area and the urban area to face the challenge imposed by the America. So China will use this, vast land use the 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 ecological resources we will we will we will we will um use this um by uh, ecological ecological uh, resources to move to towards uh towards a more balanced um uh, a, a more balanced development that is focused on the ecological civilization so to sum up, we have linked the linked once while it was the industrial indu industrial capitalization. But now we are in the financial capitalism and we are already in the second phase of the linking, the fifth year already. In face of the, the forced the linking, 
we can try to uh, try to focus on what the government, what the administration's uh, uh, strategies are. So we know that in America, first on the uh, delinking, first first the delinking on China, and at that time America didn't really gain any 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 interest. Instead, it, it was it was loaded in debts, and this is also one of the present one of the symptoms of uh, what Amin, Amin has told us about the about the in, in, in explosion of uh, capitalism. So now we, I just explained to you the, the, the two different uh, experience of the China's delinking in different era of the capitalism. That's all, thank you. Shall we have a uh, Loy? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, reply to the Gu's uh, first question about uh, the context of the world we are living in. Uh, I think that we are living in, uh, in in a very special period, the period uh, of turbulence, the period of the crisis, of the multiple crisis. The, capital, the capitalist mode of production, distribution, and consumption has led to the financial, economic crisis, social crisis, and ecological, environmental crisis. At the same time, we are also witnessing that the model, the, the democratic, the so-called democ democratic model uh, of the West, is now under big question mark, question, question mark. Uh, more and more people do not trust the political institutions, the traditional political parties and their leaders. But at the same time, the deadlock for political uh, solution push people into greater uh, crisis, crisis and uh, provide uh, the ground for all kinds of extremist tendency, including fascism, neo-fascism, and <clears throat> xenophobia. At, at the world level, we are living in a period in which the old uh, the system and order is being collapsed, and but new order has not yet emerged. So, in in words that we are in, we are living in a period of crisis of the existed uh, model, existed uh, order, but the new one has uh, is not yet there to replace the old one. And this, this is a time of transformation, but also a time of turbulence. One, one thing uh, is important to note that alternative to those issues in crisis now do not have yet uh, a real uh, solution and response to that. And in the absence of the response uh, of, of, of real alternative, uh, there will be a lot of dangers and situation. Uh, as uh, Samia Amin said, the, the times of the monsters. It's, it's therefore, I think that one of the very important uh, tasks of us is to, to, is to work out alternative to the outdated or uh, or, 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 or other things which are in the crisis. And 
This required the collective and joint work of the lab intellectuals uh, to, uh, to, to create a, a feasible and uh, scientific alternative to the issues of and contradictions that existed today. And I think by doing so, we can also uh, uh, contribute uh, to the, the advancing of Samil's wish of creating a new international for of workers and people. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Jayati? Thank you so much. This has been such a fascinating discussion. I have really learned a lot. And I think, uh, of course, we have to thank Samir for inspiring all of us. But I think he would have also enjoyed this discussion. It's really uh, been very illuminating. I, I want to take up uh, Abrima's very difficult question. I mean, first of all, he asked us to think of the good examples and then to think about the, the current context. And we've just had two very penetrating and may I say kind of depressing <laughs> perspectives on it. Well, I think Professor Wen was more positive in that, but yes, the global context is, is very dubious. You know, I think both of them, uh, both Loy and Professor Wen uh, are coming from countries that are providing us the positive examples. You know, they, and I think I go back to this point that it was strategic integration into the global economy. And I say it was strategic specifically in two very important ways. One was in terms of retaining control over finance. And that's absolutely important. So yes, there has been some liberalization of banking and allowing foreign entry into particular financial services. Sorry, I should speak slower. Okay, there has been some uh, uh, opening up in some financial subsectors, but overall, the dominant levers of banking and finance are still controlled by the public sector, and that has been crucial, I think, for the success of these economies. And the other is the active orientation towards technology development and ensuring as much access to the latest knowledge as is possible and then developing your own knowledge. I think those two are absolutely critical. They cannot be done by many smaller countries because they don't have the resources, which is why I think we, we would have to get together in regional groups and uh, other kinds of groups, but they can be done by some other countries. But I think the other big advantage that China and Vietnam had uh, let me be honest, is a revolution in the past because that revolution did many things, but fundamentally it created dignity of labor, which we don't have in India. We really do not respect labor of paid or unpaid. We do not expect, respect the human rights of workers. And I think that's true in many countries. So the revolution generated a social perception of the dignity of labor in both countries, which I think has been very important in the subsequent development. And it also reduced different kinds of uh, social discrimination, which you know, uh, earlier we used to call them feudal remnants. Now we know that capitalism uses them just as much as feudalism did, so they're not remnants anymore, but different kinds of discrimination. Of course, it hasn't abolished them, but it is significantly less. I think these are the things that in our countries we have to struggle with. We have to, of course, negotiate that global context in the strategic ways as far as we can, because the, the options are closing in that sense. But we also have to do our own domestic socio-political changes. Uh, without those changes, you know, delinking would only be a form of localized authoritarian capitalism. And I don't think that's what we want. To get to that progressive universal humanism that was mentioned by uh, John Foster, to get to an ideal of a democratic socialism, we have to do that hard work of the domestic social and political transformations within our own countries. So it's a very complex challenge for us. 
And the trouble is that we probably don't have too much time to do that because, because of all the crises that were mentioned, the, the multiple crises that Loy mentioned that are facing us around the world. The one thing I will say, the source of optimism to me, you know, Loy mentioned about how there are all these terrible right-wing tendencies and so on. It's true. But in most countries, it's the older people. It's our generation who are doing the bad stuff. And you find in most countries, younger people are actually more open, more willing to recognize change. And I find among my own students and among younger activists and scholars, they are much more brave and realistic than we were. They are courageous and they're realistic. So I really have hope that the younger generation will clean up some of the enormous mess that we are leaving behind. So Huan Ping, please. Just then, Professor Vern talked about some of the things I would like to talk about. So now I would like to talk about is the world today, what we're facing. A few days ago, oh, what I want to, if I would, should sum it up, I would say it's orderless, it's a chaos. So instead of order, we have threat, challenges, and risks. And then secondly, uh, conflicts or the contradictions, they are also a form of motivation, a driving force. This is a very fundamental, very classic theory. They are in themselves a driving force for change, a, the basis for change. So no matter it's for global south or for south-south cooperation, or for the breakthrough we want, or for us to find the alternative to capitalism. For either of these, I believe currently this chaos we're having now is actually giving us an opportunity. So this brings us back to the second question that is, for China or Vietnam, I agree that the revolution laid a very solid foundation for us. And secondly, before that, some of us, like for China, before the founding of new China, although we do not have this concept of farming, and then his theorists had were not born yet, there were already similar concepts, similar ideas. One of the, the important concepts among them is about th this independence. It's, it did not uh, came to life after 1949. Before that, when our revolution forces was still for, fragile and weak, we've already have this concept of independence. We know that we cannot rely on foreign forces, such as the KMT or the USSR. We need to be independent. Behind this is different methodologies. That is, we need to rely on the reality and start from the reality we should begin from the facts. That is, we should take a masses, the people-oriented approach. This approach is a methodology, or we can say it's a form of social organization. And many years later, as Professor Wen talked about it, when they produce, when they're industrializing, when we do all this, we take this independent approach. And behind this is this masses oriented approach. That, that's how we want to achieve this development. So also this independence is also always been part of new China's diplomacy. Uh, it has 
a similarity with Armin's delinking. Excuse me. In today's world, we global south need to right find reestablish this independence this it's a bit hard to translate really because a it both means autonomy independence and self-reliance therefore we should rely on ourselves to find our own path of development thank you Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Ibrima? Uh, I think this has been this has been absolutely wonderful, and uh, and uh, you know I think this we've got we've got uh, not only good initial contributions and a, a, a great debate in between, but uh, also the responses have brought further clarity into to the to the issues that we are dealing with. I, mean, I think the only thing to to do now is to see what if except if there is any any you know final final point that one of the panelists wants to make uh, if, if any anybody who wants still has a point that you want to yes, make by way of conclusion um otherwise yes. we, do uh, we have uh, yeah. Ooh, we wonder if professor, professor Wen would like to intervene thank you as we all know some Armin's latest and innovative thought was that this implosion, an important cause of this is this oversupply of global financial capital. If it cannot find that way out, it will implode. In my opinion, oh, we researchers who are researching to movements around the world, we should be prepared for, in terms of policy and in our own life, we should be prepared because as this global in, implosion it happen, occurs, its influences will be, will affect global economic others around the world these effects will be shifted to global south so uh, china itself is making major strategic changes right now we use our surplus production and financial capital to the to the capitalization of ecology. That, that is the industrialization of ecology. Since we have rich resources in our, in our nature and we make it a priority of our development in the next phase. So even if we de-dollarize our own currency system, will still continue to be used for the monetization of our resources. At the same time, we're also pushing forward the collective economy in rural areas so that collectives at the village level can be the agency, the subject, uh, the owner of eco ecological ownership. And they also connect them with state-owned enterprises so that they have their platforms at, at the village level. They can connect with the upper level. In this way, faced with this global financial implosion, we are in a better position to handle the crisis and we can have a soft landing. I would like to take this opportunity of this seminar today to remind our dear friends from the global south, that delinking leads to this implosion at a great cost. This cost will be shifted to less developed countries, especially global south countries, by financial capital. 
financial capital will want to shift this cost if we're not well prepared in terms of our thoughts and materially we would take the uh, feel the toll let's consider this thank you uh, in the in the film that uh, we you in the video that you saw where we had um uh, in the in the home of Sambi where you saw uh, the photos of Sambi with Isabel with a lot of paintings they were the paintings and drawings done by Isabel and she's a very good painter and uh, that was the last time uh, Francois and I and Sambi had a discussion. So uh, Sami knew that um, uh, Francois and I would always be pressing uh, on the question of en environment and climate change. So then we said, um, uh, we, 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 we had the discussion and Sami said, it's not as if I'm not concerned about the climate change or the environmental issues, but without the changing the capitalist system, there cannot be any meaningful change for these uh, other questions. So that was his uh, uh, well, uh, response uh, to the question of um, uh, climate change and uh, environment. So it was uh, 10 years ago that Sami wrote the, the paper, China 2013. So in which he talked about uh, his views about China's um, uh, achievements and also possible uh, contradictions. And it was five years ago in uh, just uh, a, a few months before he left us that he was in Beijing attending the World Marxist Congress. And uh, he it was at that time where he, when he was at the Tsinghua University uh, host and at a seminar hosted by Professor Wang Hui that he was that he expressed his concerns about the financial globalization and about the possible changes in China. So I think uh, these uh, you could be reading some of these papers. So I think um, uh, well we, we would always be saying if Samif uh, were still with us, what would he say and what would he do? I, we are very uh, sure that he would uh, tell us that we need, uh, there's nothing else but optimism, but activism, that we need to change the world. And I think, and I, I would like to thank everybody today for being in the in this seminar. I think we could be, um, uh, there's so little time, uh, it's only three hours, so we couldn't have uh, more of you to speak uh, for a longer time, but then we should be organizing more of these discussions. So for example, uh, there we could be fostering more collaborative projects between China and Vietnam uh, with Loy here and with uh, Professor Huan Ping and Wen, uh, Professor Wen here. So we could be uh, fostering more people-to-people -people discussions and uh, Jayati, there could be more discussions between uh, India and also Southeast Asia and other countries. So I hope that um, with uh, this, um, uh, with our tribute to Sami and to Isabel, we would be, uh, we would continue uh, to be uh, audacious to have uh, communism as the uh, goal for, uh, as, uh, as, as the, um, um, recipe uh, for the, the, the many crises that we are facing today. So I thank you uh, all again. Uh, Ibrima, would you like to have the last word? The last word is just a big thank you to everyone. I think this has been absolutely, absolutely wonderful, absolutely inspiring. Uh, I, I have just one, one, one point that uh, a, a Keep, keep, keep coming on, or two, two issues that, that JIT was emphasizing. One is the knowledge issue, the battles around knowledge. I think those, they were not, the significance of those, of, of knowledge in this world was not lost to Samir, which was why he invested heavily in setting up networks and research institutions and, you know, around. And I think that we should, we should really continue. And it is not an easy task, particularly when one is operating from the South. Uh, and producing knowledge that can advance these struggles, that can help these struggles, the search for solutions uh, to, to advance the, the disengagement 
or at least the renegotiation of the of the of the of the you know the conditions in which we are and their transformation. And the second one, of course, is technology. Uh, it's it's amazing what what you see that when it comes to the you know when the chips are down, the problems about the market actually are thrown out of the window. And then what you see are administrative measures being taken, you know, to the whole thing, the whole big issue becomes extremely narrowly politicized in a particular, in a particular way, which just points to the significance of the issues and the importance and their, and their strategic nature. Uh, and I think it's uh, it's something that we, should, we also need to, to be fully cognizant of and see how to build coalitions uh, across uh, the global south, across the world, basically, because we are all in this together to make sure that we continue the struggle. I think Samir has left us enough to continue uh, the, 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 we wish he was back here and would say, okay, this is what I thought before. But really asking the question of what he would have thought, how he would have, you know, thought about particular issues or responded is a way of continuing his thinking. Uh, he was rereading Marx every 20 years, the whole of Marx, you know, from one, from the first cover to the last cover of all his works, every 20 years. And then he would sit back and then, but he wasn't stuck in what Marx was saying. He was understanding Marx to look at what was happening today. And he was able to deal with the issues as they were evolving. Uh, and I think that's how we should read him uh, with a view to saying, OK, uh, we, we have this particular challenge today. We have uh, that other challenge uh, you know, point, uh, arising in the emerging and the horizon. How do we you know, get inspired by him, but go beyond his own thinking even in some instances to be able to advance this struggle, which I think would, would have made him happier than people trying to idealize him in, in, a, in one way or the other. So I would just want to say thank you very much. And congratulations to the Global University team, to you, Akinchi, and, uh, the, and, and Margaret, and Lai Sung, Professor Wen, and the whole uh, team that have been mobilized extensively behind this to make sure that you've got this interesting series of, of uh, forums organized, but also within every forum, we have a rich harvest of uh, seminars and sessions and contributions uh, and that are captured and then you know made available somewhere so really thank you very much uh, and thank you to our panelists for giving us so much uh, in a short period of time it has been extremely 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 inspiring and i think we have enough to continue this conversation and to keep you know galvanize and mobilize for the continuation of the intellectual and political struggles that samir was involved in all his life so thank That's you. What I so, want to say. Thank you. Thank again. you. So please turn on your camera.